Uh, so my name is Amber Merritt. I am a dual Paralympic wheelchair basketball player uh, representing Australia at the, both the London 2012 and Tokyo 2021 Games. And how did you come to learn about women in sports, WA? Um, I think Karen reached out I to me. I stopped you. Yeah, Karen, <laughs> Karen reached out to me on social media um, and just opened up that conversation and then it kind of just blossomed from there and it's been a very exciting journey so far. So she's going to be an intern. When we get her ready, she's going yeah. to be an intern. Now obviously um, uh, uh, you've just come back from, uh, from Tokyo. Tell us about that experience because it's in the middle of COVID <laughs> and of course... It it's a really surreal experience. Yeah. Um, hopping on a plane for the first time to a, another country in 18 months was quite strange. Um, being surrounded by our team again was quite strange. Um, going to a Paralympics where there's no one Spectrum. watching. Um, but then there was also like some really beautiful moments. You got to relish in the humanity of the Paralympic movement. The fact like, I don't know, that spectators weren't there to see it, but you got to experience it firsthand, and it was quite beautiful, and um, the teams became more cohesive, because oh, yes. we didn't have people in like, the sports, we got to chat with each other more, and it was quite, I don't know, we became more united as a nation and as a team than just, oh, it's wheelchair basketball, and oh, it's canoeing, or oh, it's swimmers. So, six of the women on the basketball team are from WA. So are you all based coming up to the Olympics and stuff here, or is your training camp here? And no. No. So, um, six girls from WA. We had two girls come across, one from Melbourne. She stayed with us all the way through till the Games. Um, she was, yeah, she didn't return home and she wanted to return home, but because of the COVID situation over there, she away was like, well, I'm going to stay. Yeah, so she stayed. Um, and then there was another girl who, uh, another two girls actually, sorry, who came across just for a week um, and then extended for another week and then went back. Um, and that was just because our camps just get chopped and changed. Um, and you're flying to Canberra, there's always going to be a risk of the Perth girls coming back home and having to isolate. We experienced it twice. Um, so it was pretty You had fun. to isolate twice? I think yeah. I saw it on your feed one yeah. time. You so, were cutting down the hours. Yeah, January. So in January, I went oh, to a yeah. camp and I knew I was going to have to isolate. What I wasn't expecting was being in Canberra and then um, a COVID outbreak happening in Perth. And so we were in the middle of training and our coach just walked up and he went, All the Perth girls, pack your wheelchairs up, um, take them back to your room, um, and we will give you further notice. And so all of the Perth girls just like left, which was most of the camp, because we had eight girls at that camp at the time, and there was 14, 15, 16 girls at the camp, so half of them just been That's half the team. Just disappeared. Um, and the head coach. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Bye. Oh, the And the head coach. Um, and then the second time it happened, we were in Canberra, and it was a three day camp, because after that experience, we were just like, make them shorter, make them short and sweet, and let's minimize that risk. And then, um, we were at the airport and the boys had a camp after our camp. So the girls had their camp and the boys had their camp. And the boys were flying in on the plane that we were leaving out of Canberra on. And I'm on my phone, I was like, oh, Mark McGowan's calling a press conference. Uh oh. Mark McGowan's just announced that ACT is now a high, like, is a medium risk. So you state. were on the plane at the time? I was, leaving? I was 10 minutes off of boarding for this flight. And so then it was like, oh, you. Um, you have to isolate for two weeks upon return home. And the flight was a full flight and it went down to 80 people on the flight. So Amber, I asked a six-time Olympian called Tessa Sanderson, right? I asked her a question about your mental health and COVID and lockdown. How do you cope? How did you cope? Um, there's part of me that goes control the controllables. Yeah, and, and there's things like, always says that. Control the controllables. Like it's not in my, like me being stuck in isolation is not within my control. Because at the end of the day, that is the rules that we have to abide by for our state and for people to stay safe. Um, but I can control my mentality towards it and I can control my preparation for it. So uh, my preparation for Tokyo and knowing that I was going to isolate afterwards, I knew, okay, well, I need things that are going to keep me active and busy and... Oh, I'm actually going to enjoy the forced rest because that's yeah. what it was. It was forced two weeks rest, no training. I didn't 
hire any gym equipment in my isolation. I just binge watched Netflix. I drank lots of coffee. Annabelle McIntyre said, I played computer games. Like, yeah. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. I've never played them before. So, bless my partner's cotton socks. For my birthday this year, he bought me a gaming laptop so that I would save money because I am a shopaholic. And, um, I bought a HDMI cable and I have an Xbox controller and I used my HDMI cable and I linked it to the, the TV. Yeah. Had my Xbox controller and I would lay in bed and play Spyro um, and Doom and like I love games. I'm a little bit of a nerd too. So. Well, it is so interesting to talk about, you know, yeah, how do you cope when we know that you're all in lockdown and, you know, yeah. you know like it is, you have to. Yeah, like even at the moment, so I can't go home to Ireland because yeah. we're not allowed out. But I haven't been home in nearly three years. That's breaking my heart. You yeah. Know? When you normally go home every, you know, sixteen months or so. So you can't think about it. It's if you think about it, it's too much. Yeah. yeah. I'm also such a believer in like sitting in that space though as well. Like there were days when I was in isolation in a hotel, and I didn't even get out of bed. I like. I would get phone calls from my family and they'd be like, hey, what did you do today? And I was like, oh, I just watched this documentary on Netflix. And they're like, did you open the blinds? I'm like, nah. <laughs> ordered a coffee on them. Ordered a coffee. I'm still in my pajamas. Haven't showered. Haven't even brushed my teeth, which is disgusting. But no. I'm not seeing anyone. I don't need to impress anybody. <laughs> and then I would feel like, I would feel kind of crap. But then I'm also like, no, I have to sit in this space because I Stay can't moment, change it right now. Yeah. Like, I can try and force it out of me, but it's no, let's just be here present in it. And the other thing I noticed with watching Natasha Haynes and Ash Stanis go into school and talk about, um, like I love, I will never turn around and say our conversation is today about mental health, because you can't do it. Our every day our conversation is about mental health. Every day, like my mental health is different than your mental health and I can't fix yours as much as you can fix mine. Yeah. But the girls go into schools and they talk about techniques that they use on the pitch and they relate it to exam pressures. Yeah. That's a generational thing for me. You girls and women are coming up through the awareness. Like to me you are so aware of your own mental health. Like, when I was playing football, if we lost, we went. Yeah. Like, that's how we coped. Yeah. That's how we did it. Like, but you girls are like, Anne's just like, you know, this is my. If I have to rationalise in my head that I didn't kick that goal, and that goal led to another goal down the end, but I can't focus on that. I have to be in the moment. Yeah. So I think. Like, when do you learn that? Just through lived experience. Like, I'm not shy about my battles and my demons, and I've had like highs and lows, and we had this discussion about leveling up before, like, something happens, you level up, something happens, you level up, It's it knocks you back, but you go higher. Um, like, 2019 was probably my worst year ever. I ended up having a mental breakdown and ending up in Joondalup Emergency Ward with my parents. Um, I took... I stepped away from my job, I took time away from sport, I reassessed where I was at and I really had to like look at my priorities and stuff. And then from that I was like, no, basketball is a priority, um, do I actually need to be doing full time work and everything else I was doing? I was studying women's leadership but I was no, stressing you know, you, myself. you need to do women's sport WA, like don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of go like... You will learn women in leadership through women's sport Yeah. WA. And that's it. I was kind of like, oh, am I investing in the right things in my life? No, I wasn't. Because all those things I was investing in were taking time away from investment in myself. So one of the ladies who we had on the screen was Chantelle, and she runs Kojo Sport, which is so fantastic. But when she was over playing for uh, Eagles W, she said to me, Karen, you know, what about when I want to have a baby? And what does that do to my sports career? And I said, oh my God, you've got the masters. <laughs> but Jen, I've, I've you know, masters are out there. I didn't know they were out there. It took me two kids to figure out some of a whole world sport out there called masters. I had a teammate who actually had a baby, um, Claire Knott. 
Yeah. She um, after re after not qualifying for Rio, she fell pregnant. Yeah. yeah. And it was like she had eleven other babysitters. Chloe travelled with us yeah. from the age of three months old. I remember picking her up and putting her on the plane, like on the plane, taking her to change her nappy because Claire yeah. couldn't get up to do it yeah. herself. And, and that's the thing. It's still it's like we normalise everything. We have to normalise having a baby and how your baby is brought up by your team. Yeah. yeah. And it's like. Oh, it was the most, it was incredible. Because then in our team, it was kind of like, oh, we lost a game. And then Chloe would like be in the circle and she'd like crawl up someone's wheelchair and you're like, I can't be mad. <laughs> like, That's so beautiful. Yeah, like, I'm so disappointed, but oh man, like, baby. Okay, so one question we asked about what women in sport WA means for you. What does women's sport mean for you as a global phenomenon at the moment? I think having more women in sport and having more support around women in sport is it's so incredibly important because we need to have more girls play sport. In wheelchair basketball, and like drawing from our experiences right now, for the Paralympic selection this year, we have 14 girls in our squad. That means tw two girls are getting cut, 12 girls are going. Two girls ended up not going due to the mandate of the COVID vaccination. So our team was automatically picked. So then there's no progression in our sport because there's no one from beneath there's no pushing pathways. anyone. There's no, yeah. path those, no those pathways. Grassroots pathways. There's no pathways. There's no one pushing the more elite girls to be like, hey, I'm coming for your spot. Are yeah, you going to yeah, be better? Yeah. So then Get you become to. complacent. And then as a nation, you're not actually going to be better because you're kind of stuck in this space. Now, can I ask a question? How, <laughs> that's my son. Okay. Can I ask you How was your performances? How, let's get this right. How did you feel about your performance as a team in Tokyo? Um, <laughs> I feel like I always say if you don't want to answer, go. Eh, eh, next no, question. I feel like I have to be diplomatic, but like I'm also brutally honest because I think honesty is the best policy. I was very disappointed. Yeah. I think that our team has a lot more potential than what we displayed at the Paralympic yeah, Games. I that's what I thought too when I watched this. Yeah. But but I also am compassionate because there are girls there who've never been to a Paralympics before. There were 10 out of 12 girls who'd never gone to a Games before. There was, yeah, it was a fresh baby team. Like, we've got a lot of young blood. And then, you know, there were some girls who've never even been to a World Championships before. So we've got all these young, young brains, and you throw them into an arena that is so overwhelming. Not only are they like, oh, I now have to perform, they're like, oh, I'm at a Paralympics. And all of Australia is watching on TV. Like, I would have hate to think what they was going through their brains when they were spectators. Um, Do you not think that it would have been different? It would have been more energizing if there were spectators there? I think so. But I also think there is that element of overwhelming as well. I know I was very lucky in my upbringing with the gliders that when I went to a Paralympics, I, uh, there was only two of us who actually debuted. The rest had already been to a Paralympic Games okay. before. So, so you had that sort of mentor yeah. of a player to be able to pull you through, that older player be able to pull you through that nerves and experience. Yeah. That. And it was kind of like, okay, these are our, these are our babies and we're going to nurture them through this experience. Yeah. Whereas at this Games, it's kind of like it the like two of us. You, you, you with your arms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like... <laughs> And then I also had to take care of myself because it was also a situation that was unlike any other and we were separated from families and you know I've had tournaments where I've been on the phone to my mum in tears just been like, I don't want to be anymore. I have to have that space for myself as well as open the space for my girls to nurture them so I have to hold on. Okay, let's not talk about wheelchair basketball here. Let's talk about the style, <laughs> and the fashion, the fashion, the fashion. Yeah, let's talk. I have nothing to do. You can yes. talk. Oh, but like, so, um, so something people don't know about me is that um, I studied fashion and textile design. Wow. Yeah. So after London, I kind of pulled my finger out my backside and went, oh, I should probably do something because the sport doesn't last forever. So I studied fashion and textile design, and I realised that. The creation of fashion is not my forte. I, I'm not a sewer. I can fix things and I can rehem, but I am not someone who's going to go. 
I want that in a gown. Um, but I really liked the design elements and the people skills of it. Um, I also have been collecting vintage since I was 14 years old. So um, now that's made a big comeback as of late. It um, has. A lot of uh, you see kids that are, are purchasing 70s or 60s Ray Bans. Yeah. Uh, you know, old uh, Gucci uh, handbags and whatnot, and they're going for top dollar. Yeah. So um, I was 14. It was my very first sports awards, and my my mum has a friend who sells. She's known as the vintage hat lady, and so she has. Um, she would travel the world with her daughter. Um, her daughter worked at Varga Girl and now is Belize a vintage and she um, I, <laughs> and would buy these dresses and these items from Paris and New York and um, I was very lucky that they were my friends because they would come back from these trips and come in and be like we found these colors and we think you'd look really pretty in them and I went thank you and I would pick what I wanted and then I would always know when they were coming back from trips because I could just go to I would go visit Claire I would go visit Wendy and I'd just be like I love this I love that I love this so um, I ended up with a wardrobe of over 150 vintage dresses um, which is what most girls dream of but once my my wardrobe bar snapped twice and my dad had to fix it we knew I had a problem. <laughs> Um, and sometimes, That's not a problem. No. It just wasn't strong enough. No, exactly. Um, so then I, I started fashion and textile design because of my love for unique fashion. And then there was a point where I, I kind of stepped away from that side of myself and became like the same as everyone else. And then only recently have I started exploring it again because I, I love that side of who I am. I'm not just an athlete and I'm not just not one the person like I have very unique taste and I, I love what I do you're expressing your your creative abilities as well so well, it's, yeah I believe so so I opened a business um, I sold secondhand I uh, sold secondhand designer and vintage clothing and it started because I had so much so much and I wanted so much more I was like I've got to get rid of some to give myself some um, and so yeah, I started selling vintage and secondhand designer. Um, unfortunately, basketball kind of took over again because it's really hard to take photos of stock and keep a website going and attend markets and do all this other stuff. So I was just like, ah. Oh. So I do actually have a, my poor parents have a spare bedroom at their house and it has got- um, Your amazing parents. Yeah, my bless their hearts. Six racks of clothes that date from 19, I think my oldest is a 1920s dress. So you're the vintage, vintage? I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I did photo, um, I did photography with Rosie Button. Yeah, she did a full vintage photo shoot with me. So I've got. Um, we still have to do your photo shoot with staff. Yes. Yes. I've and got. She wants to do them like at different locations. Ah, oh, awesome. Um, so I have two Holston pieces, they're my babies. Um, I know. And when the documentary on him came out on Netflix, I was like, <laughs> you keep those locked. Yeah. yeah, okay. Oh. Very well pressed, very well steamed. Um, mothballs everywhere. Yes, so yeah. don't care. Um, most of like my prized, prized dresses are in dress bags, um, just so that they stay very neat. And I'm trying to think of some of my other best pieces, but. Fashion to me, like I look at fashion and I think it's an art form yes. and that every individual is a canvas and they're expressing their art form and their individuality through fashion. Um, so I do look at girls and sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, we're wearing the same white tank and t-shirt, but then I'm also kind of like, hey, if that's who you are, that's who you are and I appreciate that. But then I also look at someone who, you know, like I look at Robin Lambert, for instance, and I think she is a style icon in the way that she dresses and the way she like just she's fearless on the fashion front she is not uh, she's willing to try anything yeah um, the confidence that she has when she tries something new I yeah and she poses and sets the scenes and the, oh yeah yeah Huge incredible fan. incredible woman and like just everything about it is so effortless and I think as well like fashion when it is your own expression of yourself is effortless we don't look at it and go oh that's naff because we go that actually looks awesome on that person because that's who they are that's their being um, and there's also something 
when you look at the art form of the individual and their fashion sense and their creativity. I think there's also something quite vulnerable and quite raw about it as well. So I, I love it. What would you say to young women looking to get into sport that maybe don't have the confidence or uh, don't know who to call? Or what, what would you say? Um, I, like, I always, when people ask me this question, I think back to what young Amber would want to hear. I love it. Um, and so I would say be fearless in your approach. Um, and don't be afraid. Just like jump in and have a crack because you never know what might happen. Um, I look back to my own experience where I thought I was too uncoordinated and I couldn't do what I was going to do and then I jumped in the chair and I, I, after six months it was like, oh I can actually do this. Um, so you never know until you try and so it's having that fearless attitude and also like don't worry about what people think. I think we become suckers, especially in this generation of social media, to this comparison. Um, and I think when we start comparing ourselves to other, whilst it's very natural and you know it's something that we've all done at times in our life, I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. I'm sure everyone's done it. Um, it's not assisting you in any form of shape, unless it's someone that you're comparing yourself to who holds the same values and standards as you do. So I think once you start doing that and you worry about what other people think and the comparison and all of that, it's not going to help. So yeah. just like be fearless in your approach and have fun. And like, have fun, yes. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you for your time, Amber. Thank Listen, you. we're going to pop your details down the bottom. And thank you for joining the Women in Sports team. Everyone go follow Amber. Yay! <laughs> Yay.